So in class, we've talked about the idea of zoos and the philosophy behind them and how we feel about them in the 21st century and some of the debates about them. So for this, I want to go back and just do a short history of zoos in general. And, it, and again, it's not too long because it's really not that complicated of a history. It's a fascinating history, in my opinion. And as I said in class, I think there's a lot of work to be done. You know, history of individual zoos, the history of, of particular species in zoos or zoos in a particular time period. In other words, I think there's a lot of historical work that can be done and political science work. Um, but, the, but the basic history itself, it's not that complicated. So, and again, this is getting back to the title is uh, kind of what we also talked about in the class. I mean, are zoos a, a, a source of conservation? In other words, the kind of the idea of, of Noah's Ark. You know, Noah's Ark, obviously the world was ending. And so Noah, uh, at God's insistence, saved representative of each species so that when the flood was over with, he could release them and repopulate the earth with all these animals. And that is the idea I think a lot of people have of modern zoos. In fact, even in class, people mention that, you know, we're protecting animals that may be dying out in the wild. So are zoos uh, an ark or are they, you know, a prison for our entertainment? In other words, is it cruelty or is it, is it kindness what we're doing? Uh, and that debate has kind of been there for a long time. That's not anything new, but, but it's interesting because we can see the debate the development of some of these ideas over the last 150 years or so. So, so zoos themselves are relatively new, maybe 150, 160 years. Um, I actually, I think we're, we're, we're creeping up to over about 200 years at this point. It depends on what you consider to be the first true zoo. Um, but the idea of keeping animals is, is an ancient human idea. You know, going all the way back to some of the earliest humans, you know, keeping animals as livestock, both for eating and labor, but also um, keeping animals as pets, um, or even just allowing animals to kind of live on the outskirts of a village, for instance. I mean, a lot of what we now call pets originally would have started as animals kind of, kind of on the verge between being a pet and being a wild animal, right? Um, the way sometimes we treat pigeons or the way we treat squirrels today in some cases, we've had bird feeders in our yard. So there's always been this element of kind of keeping animals and, and, and having control over animals. That does seem to be almost a human impulse. And every culture does it in some way or fashion. Um, but the actual keeping of zoos, say in cages, starts a little bit later, although we can see it going back as early as 25, uh, 2500 BC in places like Egypt. Um, so, and what we tend to refer to these keepings of animals, not as zoos, although they may on the surface look like as what we consider to be a zoo, but they're really referred to as menageries. Now, that's a French word, it, you know, in, in, in French culture, um, it's a term they use, but, but historians have picked up this term to kind of refer to all of these things. And you see it used in, I mean, even Harry Potter, there's the menagerie of, 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 supernatural animals, right? Um, and you see this used in, in fantasy fiction, you see it used in, in other uh, works, you know, this menagerie of monsters or something like that. But the word itself is a French word, it means to manage. So the idea, uh, you know, in the French language, a lot of times they'll take a verb and they add the E sound, the I, E or Y uh, to the end of it, and it, it, then it means the place to do that thing. So a bakery is a place to bake, a nursery is a place to nurse, a cookery is a place to cook. A menagerie is a place to manage, in particular manage animals. So that's, that's the origin of the word menagerie. Um, but it's basically a word to describe the collection of animals, usually by a leader, you know, somebody in power, a king, an emperor, uh, a lord, Sometimes it might be of a government, but usually it's one person's uh, keeping of animals as a kind of a display of wealth and power. Uh, and we see this in our, you know, in our society. There's plenty of people, drug dealers, um, pop stars, actors, that they get a bit of money, lottery, <laughs> lottery winners. People get money and they buy an exotic animal. And they get more money, they buy more exotic animals. And for, you know, I mean, when I, when it immediately comes to mind is Michael Jackson, he had a private zoo. William Randolph Hearst had his own private zoo at San Simeon in California. I mean, he had a massive zoo, actually. Um, 
you know, some of you know, there's hippos and, and the feral hippos that are wild in Colombia. And this actually came from a cocaine dealer that bought hippos. And then when he got arrested, he, they, they just went wild. Uh, so the, again, we still see this, this impulse in the modern era. Um, but we can see images of menageries, again, going back to the Egyptians. I mean, we can even see, you know, we have descriptions of them, but even in some of the artwork, it shows what are clearly the keeping of animals. Um, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar kept animals. Uh, we see Mansa Musa in Western Africa, who's still considered to be the richest person to have ever lived, kept animals in Western Africa. Even in the new world, we tend to think of zoos, the origins of zoos as being kind of an old world phenomenon because we think of giraffes and lions and tigers, elephants when we think of zoos, but there were, there were early menageries even in the new world, the most famous of which was um, when the Spanish arrived in 1519 and what is now referred to as the Aztec empire. Um, uh, Emperor Montezuma kept a, a pretty large menagerie um, the Spanish described it, but we also see it in the Aztec records because we do have these what, what are known as codices. And the way I describe them, they're almost like comic books, but they were historical record keeping that the Aztec did. And, uh, and, and, and they clearly show menageries in them. But we also know this through the archaeology. Um, not only were there large cats like jaguars and panthers, but also foxes and bears, all and and dozens and dozens of different species of birds. They had an aviary so big that, it, that apparently it had like 300 employees managing it. Um, so again, menageries are not just a European thing. Although I think most of the time, including myself, when we think of a menagerie, we usually are thinking of a European monarch. Um, in fact, the idea of, again, a lion as a symbol of royalty is a very common thing throughout Europe. Um, you know, the king of the jungle, if you will. And in Europe, it was very common for monarchs. I mean, it, we see this in the Roman Empire. I, it, we see it with the Greeks, but we definitely see it post-Roman uh, era with most of the major monarchs throughout Europe. And that is the idea of keeping exotic animals, in particular lions, but, but any kind of ferocious animal. Um, and again, a lot of the, the royal symbols, like on the screen, this is the Scottish royal symbol. It shows a lion. Um, the lion representing the king. So again, it was, a, it was a type of display of power. I'll explain that in a second. <laughs> I just jumped the gun. Uh, a display of power, uh, a sign of wealth. Look at me. Um, I, I'm so powerful. I can get animals from faraway lands. And what's really interesting is that most Europeans at that time really had no concept of Africa. Uh, Europeans had this image that Africa was really a tiny island. Um, and it wasn't until the 1400s that, that they realized that it's, it's a massive continent. In fact, they only discovered, Europeans only discovered Africa as being a large continent just 50 years before they discovered the new world. So they were getting these animals from lands they didn't really even know anything about. I mean, that's what made them even more valuable is that they're from faraway mystical lands, basically. And again, just like the keeping of animals we see in the modern world, um, we also see the use of animals as diplomacy, because that was one of the things back in the, the Middle Ages, monarchs would trade animals with each other as almost a diplomatic tool. Um, and, and we see this in the modern era, in particular uh, with China. I mean, we see it elsewhere, but, but this was the, probably the most well-known version. Back in the early 70s, Richard Nixon, before Watergate, uh, did actually a couple of quite impressive things from a political science, from an international relations viewpoint. He not only reopened relations with Russia, but he also reopened relations with communist China. And in fact, played them against each other and began to calm down the Cold War for a while. Uh, and that's what this is, is, is his meeting with China. In fact, Nixon went to China, uh, which no president had done at that point. Uh, and part of this negotiating process was that China gave us a couple of pandas for the National Zoo, the, the official zoo of the United States in Washington, D.C. I don't re really remember this, but I grew up in D.C. for my first four years, and there are whole movies of even myself looking at these pandas. And, you know, it's funny thinking back that, that I would have had no idea that that was a product of the Cold War and actually uh, an image of the thawing of relationships between China and the United States. And we still see this today, what's known as panda diplomacy. Um, and very often, I mean, politicians do get benefits because people love pandas and China knows this and they do use this often to, to ease relations and such and, and to um, 
Greece, if you will, uh, conversations with other countries. So again, we still use animals in the way that people were using animals in the Middle Ages. Probably the most well-known menagerie, um, partly because of just how long it was around, was what was known as the Tower Menagerie. Of course, the Tower of London, which in my as a kid, I always thought it was just a giant tower, but really it's a, it's a castle. Uh, and it goes all the way back to William the Conqueror. And it, you know, over time built up, built up, and eventually became kind of a symbol of not only the royalty's power, but, but really a symbol of, of the law, because it was often used as a prison, a lot of beheadings happening there. Um, today, it's where the crown jewels of England are kept. Um, but for all the way up to uh, 1834, it was also basically a zoo, uh, a menagerie. Um, that was, again, where just basically where the kings and queens of England kept their exotic animals, uh, eventually would have been made public. So there's a change in, in the 1700s from animals as a product of royalty and just simply as a symbol of power to something that could be enjoyed by the citizens of a country. And this is a European change. And of course, this is coming out of the scientific revolution, which we already talked about changes our relation, our, sorry, as a European descendant, I'm saying our, but changes Europeans' viewpoint of nature and the relationship with nature. Um, but also the enlightenment, which, which took scientific ideas, but applied them to government, applied them to philosophy. And, and so the idea that part of the role of government, part of the role of society was to edu have an educated public. And this is the beginning of the rise, what eventually is public education, the democratization of universities, slowly, but eventually, um, but really promoting public knowledge and giving public lectures and having royal societies, which were basically scientific societies and sponsoring research and things like that. And the keeping of animals in these menageries were transformed with the, these new ideas about science and the role of science and knowledge in society. So for instance, you start getting things like botanical gardens, which um, like Kew Gardens in London is probably the most famous and one of the earliest, this idea of, of keeping a large garden organized uh, taxonomic, taxonomically. Uh, in other words, you know, families of plants growing together and sort of, again, a world made miniature through plant life. And really zoos, we, we just we tend to just shorten it to zoo, but really zoological gardens is just the animal version of a botanical garden. And some of these were joined together. They were there were two things at once. But but a zoo is again, it's just the animal version of a botanical garden. And again, the idea of you can see the world made miniature, all these families of animals, you know, you, you have your big cats and then you have your lizards and reptiles and you have your snake house, and then you have what usually just called the monkey house, but also included apes, you know. And the idea that, again, you can see the world uh, all at once. And again, the whole idea is that by looking at these animals with their labels and such, you get a sense of the connections of all these animals in the world and such. And again, even today, zoos are technically museums. And I know we talked about this in class already. Um, with exhibits, they're just living museums is what they are. With, with that same, I mean, there's an entertainment aspect, I think more than we want to admit. But there's definitely this kind of museum educational aspect. And, and again, we start seeing this first with menageries, but then eventually the emergence of a true zoo. Uh, the Tower of Menagerie is, for instance, made public uh, during the Enlightenment era. This is uh, just an etching of the Tower of Menagerie in 1820. And you see, obviously, the public is, you know, the, the keeper is showing members of the public around. Um, and if you ever go to a tower, I mean, you know, you know the, the, you can, it still looks like that today, if you ever get a chance to. They don't have animals anymore, though. Um, but we also start seeing, in addition to these, you know, the, these royal menageries that, that in some cases are still, some go away, but a lot of them are kept. Um, they're just starting to be made public. But we're also starting to see basically private menageries. And again, um, I, think, I think even to this day, we still see menageries. They call themselves zoos, um, even sometimes call themselves sanctuaries. I know in class we talked a little bit about that. You know, um, sanctuaries and, and and you know protected areas for animals can be a wonderful thing. Um, circus animals that have been abused, they get they escape from the circus, they they live out their lives in these wonderful sanctuaries. But sometimes those are really just private menageries. They call themselves sanctuaries. <laughs> to get money and um, but you know I think a lot of small zoos little tourist attractions Florida has a few of these 
they're not really zoos, they're really menageries. So we still see this today, but for instance, Exeter Exchange, uh, which was in London, was one of the most famous of these private menageries, it's kind of a cross between a modern zoo and a circus. And I'm not really getting into circuses today, but circuses were also basically traveling menageries, right? I mean, you know, you think of a circus, you think of the lion tamer and people riding around on elephants, right? And uh, dancing bears and all that. I mean, those are basically, there are menageries that are putting on a show, traveling menageries with a show, right? So the things like Exeter Exchange, which is incredibly famous uh, in London, was, and again, an example of, of, of these private uh, for-profit menageries. And again, like I said, it looks like a zoo, but, but, but it's much more of a museum where it's clearly all in one big room and uh, and again, as an animal lover, you think of this and go, oh my gosh, I mean, well, how awful that must have been, how tiny these cages would have been. And again, these are, you know, I come from Florida, I'm very interested in Florida tourism as a historical topic. And again, throughout the years, we have always had these little menageries. In fact, the one on the right there, Florida Reptile Land, that one actually was located. I'm not that old. <laughs> That's the 50s, that image. But that was around all the way up until the late 80s. And I can remember when I, we used to pass it going to my grandmother's house from Jacksonville to Ocala in 301. And I used to always want to stop by. And finally, my dad and I, what was it this, about 84, 85, I was like 12. And we finally went in and we paid like three bucks to get in. And it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen. I regretted immediately that we went in, that we gave money to this place. Uh, it stunk like you wouldn't believe. And it was just, again, the animals look like they were in these cages practically. I remember there was an alligator just literally in a, a cement pond. A, it really looked like a septic tank. Just, he couldn't even turn around in it. And he was about 10 feet down and they just threw food at him. And I remember they, they, you could buy what they call monkey's diet, these dog biscuits, and you could throw at the animals. And I remember they had these tubes and you would run the food down the tube and, and the animals would you know, eat it when they came down. And they just looked so sad. And then I remember the, the, uh, the guy running it came out and he said, it's feeding time. And he had two buckets just full of these dog biscuits. And he just, I was like, that's all they fed these poor animals. And it was just, it was just, you know, I didn't mean to go on so long, but, but again, we do see these today still using that quite that bad. Um, these are menageries. I think do give a little bit of an insight as to what these earlier menageries probably were like, the smells, the sounds, uh, the conditions. Now, uh, the Vienna menagerie, which was a royal menagerie, and again, it's really kind of the first of the menageries. London Tower may have been more famous, but this was the first of the menageries, uh, royal menageries to be made public in 1778. And it became a model for, for other uh, countries to do the same thing. Again, sort of being influenced by the enlightenment. So Emperor Franz I, uh, it's the one who created this particular menagerie. Um, and then not that long later, it was actually open to the public. And again, monarchs are really like King George III, even though we Americans refer to him as a, a dictator and a tyrant because we rebelled against him. But actually, I gotta get a new chair. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always shrinking during these lectures. Um, but uh, King George III of England actually was very much an enlightenment thinker. And he, he, and he very much considered himself you know, a modern sort of uh, enlightened person. And many of these monarchs were the same way. Um, an area that generally was not enlightened, even though uh, he referred to himself as the Sun King, and that would have been France all the way up till 1789, with the series of King Louis that ruled um, that ruled France. These were absolute monarchs um, with no sense of real enlightenment at all. That changes with the French Revolution, uh, but in 1665, King Louis the Fourteenth created a, a massive menagerie at the Versailles palace just outside of Paris. And again, he was the one that called himself the Sun King. And here he is dressed up literally like a sun. Uh, this is some of the drawings of the planning of this. And again, kind of a panopticon here. This is kind of a central house and you get all these gardens with other animals on the outside. It's still around today. It's, it is, it's a major historical site in France. Um, but again, he it, it eventually was made public, but made public because of the French Revolution. So in uh, 1789, the beginnings of the French Revolution, kind of a relatively quaint affair that gets very violent by the early 1790s. It, we even refer to it as a reign of terror. Ultimately, the king was killed, beheaded as part of this. And, and the National Covenant um, 
basically made these royal properties public. This belongs to all of us. And the menagerie was a part of that. Many people consider this to be the first zoo um, because again, it was, it was part of the enlightenment French revolution and there was an element of education to it. But really, I, I, if you're gonna go that far, I would say the Vienna menagerie is first and the tower menagerie. But again, we can still debate, are they really zoos in, in sort of a modern sense? I personally, and I know I'm an Anglophile, but I personally think London has the first true zoo. That's what I'm arguing in this lecture. Uh, again, in London, you, know, you had the Tower of Menagerie, you had some private ones, and but there was a real push to create something better than that. Um, Stanford Raffles uh, founded the London Zoological Society, which is a scientific group to promote uh, education of animals. Um, they, they, they solicited funds to create a true zoological garden in London in what is known as Regent's Park, which is where the zoo is still located today. Unfortunately, he didn't actually make it to the finishing zoo. He gets the ball rolling. He actually passed away before it was actually open. But London opened up what, again, the first known zoological gardens, you know, and it, was, it did not start out as a menagerie, even though some of the animals from the Tower of Menagerie eventually were transferred here, but it was a purpose-built zoo, which makes it quite different from, I think, the previous incarnations of this. Um, so by the late, by 1824, we do have a functioning zoo. And again, it, going back to its mission statement, it was partly to educate the public. Conservation wasn't there yet, but the idea of educating the public about animals and promoting scientific research from the very beginning was part of the London Zoo, which again, to me, uh, marks it as the first true zoo. And this is, again, one of the etchings of an early version of this zoo here in Regent's Park. Uh, again, it was, it was very much promoted to be essentially a living museum. Uh, it was arranged taxonomically. Um, and, but the other thing they started to do, I mean, some of the other menageries did this a little bit already. Um, but they very much recognize like, okay, we're missing these animals. We need to go out and find animals to fill in these gaps in our, in our collection. So there was, again, a very purposeful idea of trying to be complete and, and really tell the full story from an educational viewpoint. They did programs that, you know, the public, it, it, it was for, initially it was only members of the Zoological Society, eventually became free to the public. Um, you know, once we get into the 1830s reforms in England, so, so this begins to open up to even the working class peoples. Um, and again, a lot of scholars, <laughs> including me, consider this to be the first true zoo. And again, a lot of things that we associate with zoos, because again, these earlier ones like Vienna and Paris, I mean, they really were more of a menagerie that just happened to be open to the public. Here, you know, you start seeing some of the features that we consider with traditional zoos. You know, you get, you get a, a monkey house, which used to be the most popular feature, a lot of early zoos at one time. Then you get in 1849, the first reptile house. And of course, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you may remember in the first book in the first movie, uh, and when Harry Potter, before he knows he's a wizard, the escape, a snake escapes because Harry Potter makes the glass disappear. That, that scene, and it was actually filmed at the reptile house at the London Zoo. I remember when my son went to London way back when he was a little kid, that was, the, that was what he wanted to see, the Harry Potter reptile house. He hates snakes, but he wanted to see that because of Harry Potter. Um, get the first aquarium at a zoo, 1853. Uh, although I must say the Chinese used to keep uh, fish as well. They kept, I think I talked about this in another lecture. They, they kept them in these ponds. We also see this in Mexico as well uh, under the Aztecs, keeping ponds where they would keep fish and turtles in the ponds, uh, which is why, uh, for instance, a lot of our, our exotic fish, that tropical fish, as they're called, that people want to keep, a lot of them are Asian fish, like goldfish and koi, uh, because that comes from the Chinese uh, really promoting this in their early menageries. But a, a true uh, aquarium, and then an aquarium that you don't have to look down on, but you can actually look into the glass aquarium, that developed in the London Zoo in 1853. The first rhino to be in a zoo, uh, the first chimpanzee, again, chimps and gorillas were relatively new to Europeans at this point. They, they were kind of these mystical creatures. Tommy the chimp uh, was the first one at the London Zoo, it was a big hit. Uh, we later see, and by the way, these some of these images obviously aren't of the actual animals because so in some cases we didn't have <laughs> photography at this time. Uh, so some of these images are just London Zoo images. The first giraffes, 1836, 
uh, Jenny the Orangutan, also 1836. Um, the first Hippopotamus, 1856. And then in the US, you know, because at that time we were getting so much of our inspiration from England, um, the first American zoo. There, again, there had been some circuses and menageries in the US, but the first true zoo was opened up in New York City at Central Park, which is still around today. It's not a huge zoo, but they, the Central Park Zoo does still exist to this day. Later, there'll be another New York Zoo in the Bronx, which is also still around. And it's one of the, considered one of the best zoos in the US. Uh, obviously, this photograph is not from 1860, but this is, this is the Central Park Zoo. So by the turn of the 20th century, zoos were very much a thing. I mean, almost every modern city has some sort of zoo. You know, so starting with, you know, Paris and London and Vienna, throughout the 19th century, you, you know, you get Berlin and you get Melbourne, Australia, and you get Philadelphia, eventually you get Washington, D.C., um, you get Chicago, and on and on and on and on, you know, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Scotland, they, they, you know, Dublin, Ireland, all of these places when they get in zoos, and then we start to see zoos happening in the places in the Middle East, we start seeing them happening in Asia as well, Japan, Tokyo gets their own zoo, so it, it's it kind of, the zoological garden, that in itself was very much an enlightenment Western idea, but again, it, that, that idea starts to transfer all over the world. So again, why suddenly in the 19th century are we seeing this expansion of zoos? I mean, some of it's just literally people copying each other. There's, there, there, there's definitely an element of that, uh, if you will, kind of becomes trendy. Um, but this is the rise of modern science. You know, this is after the scientific revolution. There's a huge public interest in science. Uh, again, we can see this, for, for instance, with Darwin's 1859 Origins of the Species. Suddenly everybody, you know, that, that was a best-selling book. There's so many discoveries made in the 19th century as people are starting to travel to Africa and explore and take photographs and take drawings. You know, we talk, you know, I'm very interested in pre-Columbian peoples like the Mayans and the Aztecs. A lot of what we know, of, even those peoples are still here today, the actual descendants, but so much of the ruins of those monuments were discovered in the 19th century and made public in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, finding lost cities, finding new territories. I mean, this is this is just the era of, of, of public science, and zoos are an expression of that. We also get kind of the second imperial period in the in the West, for instance, you know, the you have, you know, the the rise of empires after Columbus in 1492, the French Empire, the Spanish Empire, the English Empire, on and on. Those pretty much disappeared by the most of them disappeared by the early 19th century. Um, English empire doesn't ever quite disappear, but then we see the rise of new empires, but, but instead of being in the new world, they're in places like Africa and Asia. Um, and, and in fact, these empires are much larger and much more ambitious and much more powerful. And so again, suddenly, especially with Africa, you get this influx of imperial uh, resources coming into Europe. Um, and, then, and then from there, selling them to other zoos. So, so suddenly getting an elephant, getting a tiger, getting a lion, getting a rhinoceros, it's not as big of a deal as it would have been in the 1600s. Um, typo, not netter, but better, <laughs> transportation and communication uh, systems. So it's much easier for people to get the zoos, much easier to advertise the zoos, much easier to get animals to the zoos. Uh, and as I said, with the rise of science, there's a huge interest in natural history at the popular level. And again, um, something you guys have brought up, as we become more urbanized with the rise of modern cities, people are looking for that connection with nature and being very curious about nature. I, I, again, I think we even saw this in the 1700s with changing attitudes about nature in general. As we have less direct contact with nature, we fear it less and we're more interested in it. It's more nostalgic. Uh, I think zoos are, are filling all these gaps, if you will. Uh, for the United States, I think that even though there's already one in New York, but I think the symbol of our commitment to zoos came with the establishment of the National Zoo, part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., founded in 1889. And again, the mission statement of it is very clear, the advancement of science and the instruction and recreation of the people. And it's interesting that science is up front, then education then recreation slash entertainment, it, that comes third. So again, it really putting up front what the whole idea of a zoo is supposed to be. Something else is happening in the United States, and we've talked about this in other lectures as, as we're urbanizing, as we're closing off the frontier, um, and we're, we're doing massive development and natural resource extraction, there is a growing awareness of the limitations of nature. 
obviously bison uh, almost go extinct. But you know, around the around the turn of the century, around 1900, the passenger pigeon, a, a, a species that would have numbered literally in the billions. There are descriptions of flocks of passenger pigeons in the early 19th century flying overhead for literally two or three days of a nonstop flock, um, gone by by the early 1900s. Carolina parakeet gone, uh, an extinct species. The dodo, not American, uh, but nonetheless a very highly publicized extinction. Uh, in fact, we still talk about the dodo as, as something being extinct, being out of touch. Um, the Antarctic wolf, the ivory-billed woodpecker. This one's interesting because uh, by the turn of the century, it was already very, very rare to see one, although we do get sightings of them all the way up till about the 1950s. About 12 years ago, uh, I'm recording this in 2021 in case someone's watching this much later than 2021, but but about 12, 13 years ago in the, in the earlier 2000s, there was a very famous sighting, perhaps in Arkansas, of an ivory-billed woodpecker by a couple of people one time. Um, but it, it has never been verified. And actually this year, fall of 2021, um, the United States officially declared the ivory-billed woodpecker to be fully extinct. Um, and it probably has been for decades, but but even as early as the 1900s, there was already recognition that this is an animal that will be going extinct. And by the way, Georgia and Florida were one of the main areas for the ivory-billed woodpecker. So there's starting to this growing idea that zoos aren't just for education and science and entertainment, but also as a conservation tool. Again, the idea of of, of the of, of the Noah's Ark function of zoos begins to take root. Even early menageries, which this is a photo of a menagerie, uh, advertising itself. And by the way, notice the term use of the term panopticon. Um, you know, they often refer to itself as Noah's Ark because Noah's Ark is really just a big menagerie, a big floating menagerie, right? Um, but but the now the philosophical idea of a Noah's Ark, the idea that we're saving the animals, begins to take root and. In particular in the US, this very much became a, a real goal of the US. And I think, again, because we could literally see North America go from a frontier, a wilderness, although, as we've already talked about, wilderness is really kind of a human idea. There were Native Americans here for 15,000 years. But nonetheless, what were perceived as a wilderness literally disappearing and those animals in these wilderness areas disappearing. They could literally see it in front of them happening in real time. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, and, and, and is that is the whole idea of human zoos. It's really, it's kind of a whole different topic. Um, but, but whenever people study zoos today, this is something that does come up. Late 19th century was the beginnings of what later will be known as scientific racism. People taking ideas of Darwin and applying these ideas of natural selection and what Herbert Spencer referred to as the survival of the fittest that's not Darwin's term, and applying that to human society, human politics, human war, uh, human advancement to the you know of, of using this as an idea to talk about one group of people being literally advanced, evolutionarily speaking, over another group of people. An idea that we know through DNA and, and other studies to be totally garbage, but at the time this was considered the height of science. And since zoos displayed the relationship between humans and animals and animals with each other, the thought was, well, we can use zoos to also talk about the human family and, and the different levels of humans. And, and we'll put on display these savage humans so that we civilized humans can see them and see where we came from. So we do begin to see what's known as human zoos. Now, some of these were parts of world fairs. So they were more like just exhibits. And, uh, but in other cases, they were actually people kept actually in zoos in some cases. Um, and again, this, is, this happens in the US, but we're seeing it happen throughout Europe as well. The most famous case is Oda Benga, who was um, basically purchased from Belgian Congo, um, which if you don't know much about that, was one of the sites of some of the, some of the literally some of the worst atrocities in history happened in the Belgian Congo in the early uh, 1900s. Literally millions of people were killed. Uh, and basically slavery was brought back and um, so you could practically unofficially buy people. And Odebenga was brought to the United States and displayed at uh, the Bronx Zoo 
Now, it was only for a short period of uh, September of 1906, and it was supposed to last a bit longer. It never was meant to be a permanent exhibit, uh, but, it, but it was supposed to last a little bit longer. But there was a massive outcry over it, uh, even though this is an era in American history where racism was accepted. But at the same time, um, this, this kind of went too far for many people. Obviously, African-Americans like the NAACP and Booker T. Washington very loudly protested this. But so did a lot of other Americans. It just it, it felt like one step too far because Odebenga was literally kept in the monkey house and, and literally displayed with apes as pretty much a fellow ape. Um, and, and they gave him a little prop bow and arrow. Um, I don't have, I don't think I have a particular photo in this exhibit, or excuse me, in this uh, PowerPoint, but if you look at my lines, you'll see if he's smiling, he has very sharp teeth because um, the culture he, he was from in the Congo, actually that was part of their process was uh, the males would, would literally foul down their teeth. So he had this exotic look. He looked something very, very different from uh, a, a typical American. And, and, then, and then they played that up with the way they dressed him and, and displayed him. Uh, eventually he was, they ended the, the display. Um, he, he worked for the zoo for a little bit. Eventually an anthropologist manages to get him out of there and that he lived in New York for a while. He always wanted to go back home. Um, that, that never happened. And a few years after this, he did actually commit suicide. Uh, so it's a very, it's a sad uh, story and it ends very sadly on top of that. Um, and again, it, for in the modern era, in the last 10 to 15 years, this is a pretty hot topic in, in studies, uh, in particular, any time we talk about zoos, this always comes up. Again, I, to me, it's almost a slightly different topic related, um, but at the same time, it, it, it is, it is a, a, an important topic. And, and it's kind of a hidden history now. Most people aren't really aware that this happened uh, over about a 40 year period. Getting back to the animal side, though, um, you know, despite all this emphasis on conservation and education, I mean, you know, zoos really did have a prison look. I mean, it, it is, you know, it, it, I, to, even to me, when I think of like a classical zoo, like in an old book or an old movie, that's what I think of. I think of the bars and animals in these cages. Um, there was a lot of pushback on this. People like Ernest Seton. Some of you may know that name. Um, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Galt Brown at, at ABAC talks a lot about him because he was one of the uh, founders of the American Boy Scouts, which was of course based on the British version of the Boy Scouts, which Dr. Galt Brown is an expert on. Um, he was a, a writer, he was a conservationist, he was a wilderness artist, um, in addition to his work with scouts. In fact, part of scouts was to get young men back in touch with nature, right? And teach them practical skills. Um, he wrote quite a bit about zoo animals. He didn't like them. He, he, he thought this, is, this isn't what we should be doing. He described zoo animals as being depressed, having clearly obvious mental problems, and that, that if you're going to keep animals, we need to give them changes, day-to-day -day changes and stimulations and such. And his writings actually hit a nerve with a lot of people. So even early on, there were people uncomfortable with some of the aspects of a zoo. And at the time that he's writing, there's also a movement over in Germany. Uh, a, a zookeeper named Carl Hagenbeck uh, is working. He runs the Berlin Zoo, and he is trying out some new ideas. Basically, I mean, he had basically, you know, he, you know, some of his early things were basically menageries and circuses. But you know, he was a big player in the zoo world. Uh, he was very close with William Hornaday, who was the, the guy who ran the Bronx Zoo and the guy who brought Odebenga to the U.S. Um, but Hagenbeck began to work on this idea of natural exhibits, barless exhibits, um, which kind of gives us an illusion of freedom. I mean, animals are still imprisoned, if you will. They're still captive animals, and they don't really have as much space as it appears. It's still better than a bar cage. But, but you know, again, as we talked about in class, you know, once it gets night, they go back into an actual cage because they don't want them escaping at night. They don't want other predators coming in, you know, animals hunt at night. So for lots of reasons, they put animals in the cages at night, but at least during the day, it looks like they're in a natural setting and had to be better for the animals. At least there's things to do and, and, and act, you know, they can climb things and walk things. And so these are some of the examples of his, of his exhibits that really, you know, kind of like at Disney's Animal Kingdom, if you go there, it, it, I tell you, like you're in Africa. 
uh, there's still cages, but you just don't see the cage part. You don't see the the, the boundaries that they're they're cleverly hidden. So again, if you look at it from a right direction, it just looks like you're looking at nature. And it, even a lot of this is illusion. It definitely was better for animals than perhaps the earlier cages were. Uh, in fact, you can see this. Uh, if you look at the top, you can still see it's the same mountain range. Um, but but it still exists today. Some of these, and and again in the zoo world and, and actually in the museum world, these these, these displays are, are incredibly influential because it began to reveal the, what you can do with exhibits, both living exhibits but also museum exhibits. Um, you can basically hide the 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 cage aspects of these and give people an immersive experience, if you will. And some zoos began to imitate that. But, but it's ironic that that's because that's very modern. Most zoos today are doing the Hagenbeck uh, model. But there's also a period in the, the mid 20th century that's sometimes referred to as the disinfected era because early 20th century is also when we discovered germs and, 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 and um, the idea of, of, of spreading germs and, and, and you start getting new cleaners and disinfectants and such. And zoos, and also it's the modern era. I mean, you know, modernist architecture, modernist ideas. So it's kind of interesting that just as Hagenbeck is starting to become a big deal, there's kind of this push of going the other way, almost an art deco look and keeping everything very clean and germ free, uh, which again has a really cool look, but it definitely has a very unnatural look, has a very urban look. So a lot of, these are all London Zoo, by the way, but, but a lot of zoos built during this period, they, they very much have these um, very modernist cages, if you will, uh, with some natural elements added to it. But again, the idea of keeping them very clean, this is the penguin pool. So you have activities, Hagenbeck, but the look of it is very much a modernist urban look, if you will. Now, some of you have been to the Jacksonville Zoo. This is the zoo I grew up with. Um, it, it was founded early 20th century, still around today. It's a much better zoo. It's not a perfect zoo. I still, they don't seem to do a lot. They say they do a lot of science and research. I, 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 and I know they do some, um, but, but I, they're, they're, let's just say they're, they're AZA and accredited and they're better. Uh, but they're very typical of, I think, zoos in America in the 20th century. Um, where they had quite, they're not really part of the Hagenbeck era. They're much more part of the disinfectant era and even a little bit of the, perhaps the menagerie era. So this is an old brochure of, of the Jacksonville Zoo. And again, again, pretty much just classic cages and very much emphasis on entertainment, train rides, snack bars, boat rides on the Trout River. Uh, again, this is, this is, you know, I can remember this from when I was a kid. I mean, these are very classical, zoo spaces. So again, it, it's just your typical cages, if you will. Not really much of a focus on entertainment of the animals. Um, and of course, think about this as Florida, hot, humid Florida. Um, look what's behind these two guys standing here, the polar bear exhibit. Um, and again, I, as a kid growing up, these really stunk. Uh, by the way, I, the reason I, I have this postcard uh, it's a it's an older postcard of, of this rhinoceros, it's, but but for some reason this was sent out in uh, 1987, and I just this is just kind of a random thing. I just happened to notice this on the back of the postcard. They were talking about the Cape buffalo, and it says you know they're originally from South Africa where they eat kaffirs, which is by the way a derogatory term for South African black South Africans. By the way, I, I just it shocked me. I think talks talked talk about going to see a movie, and I thought it's 1987. Holy mackerel! People were using that term in 1987. Anyway, sorry. Um, this is the one I even as a little kid. This is actually a photograph my dad took of the polar bear exhibit there at Jackson Zoo. This would have been I think 79, and even as a little kid, I recognize that this is terrible because this is Florida. I can remember going there when it's 90 degrees, and you have a polar bear and an exhibit with no shade. He's in full sun and he had a little green water pool that he could kind of get into that was clearly warm water. And that's all he had to, to, to kind of cool off. I mean, it's, it, even as a little kid, I recognize this as a torture. I love the zoo, but whenever we got to this part, I remember my dad and I both were like, oh man, this is awful. And again, much more an emphasis on entertainment. I think you still see a lot of zoos today. We start to see a change in attitude in the 20th century 
as, as we start seeing what we might call a humanization of animals, um, where we, we start, you know, from an actual viewpoint, biological viewpoint, it, it, it may not always be accurate, but we start putting human emotions onto animals. Uh, although the more we learn about animals, the more we learn they do seem to have emotions and such. But, um, you know, more naming of animals and identifying with animals. I mean, there was, you know, Winnie the Pooh. Uh, there was, of course, Smokey Bear at the National Zoo. Uh, of course, we've talked about Bambi in this class. I mean, you know, again, I think that's talk about personification of animals. Um, even movies, you know, by the 20th, the 20th century, movies about the yearling, which is about a deer in Florida or Flipper or Old Yeller. You know, this idea of the love of animals and animals as, as, as feeling beings. And of course, the research by people like Jane Goodall just further add to this idea. And of course, these new attitudes towards animals, not just that they're important, but that they have feelings and that we should take care of them. And, and they're cool. And we, we name them. You know, they're kind of wild animals are kind of becoming in a weird way, collective pets almost. Um, that there starts to be kind of an anti-zoo attitude developing. Um, a famous a movie, sort of a documentary, sort of a fiction movie, uh, was born free. And of course, they, they, the animals are born free and they should remain free. They shouldn't be in zoos. Um, so again, suddenly, uh, uh, even in this class, I heard a lot of people kind of like, yeah, animals shouldn't be in zoos, they should be free. So we start seeing a bit of a change to that. So when you go to zoos today, the, even more than Hagenbeck, they really emphasize conservation, science, and that these animals are free, that, that they're free in these exhibits. And, we're, and, and, and we have to do this because we're saving them. Some of that's absolutely true, but you can also make some arguments that maybe it's not necessarily true. It just makes you and I feel better about going to a zoo. And again, um, the movie documentary Blackfish, a very, you know, which very much changed, I think, a lot of recent attitudes, came out in 2013, changed a lot of attitudes towards zoos, aquariums, performing animals, and our relationship with them. And we'll, who knows in our lifetime where zoos are going to be heading, how they're going to change, and how we're going to relate to them in the future. All right, thanks, guys.